In quantitative finance, it's primarily about trying to estimate something where you don't know, where you don't have a view of what could be the right value for it. Quantitative modeling does require hiring people with sophisticated level of understanding and knowledge about these mathematical and statistical models. Stochastic calculus tends to be used more on the trading side and when you're thinking about some of the derivatives. In the credit risk space, they use a lot more of regression type models or decision tree based models, more what you would look into the machine learning space. If you have dipped into the financial world through Hollywood's lens with films like The Big Shot and Wall Street, you have likely seen charismatic men seemingly saving the world from the brink. But in the real world, the answers to complex problems in the finance world come not from Gordon Gekko-style charisma, but from professionals equipped with data and complex algorithms. They are the quants. Quantitative analytics professionals diligently sifting through tons of data, building complex mathematical models, and crafting financial strategies that form the backbone of the industry. My guest today is Swati Ejiwal, a long-term leader in quantitative analytics in the banking industry. In this episode, we go into the depths of life of quants and the journey involved in becoming one. This is Career Calling, and I'm your host, Pratibha Pani. Hi, Swati. Welcome to Career Calling. Hey, Pratibha. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. I'm really excited to learn about, I think, one of the popular jobs, which is quantitative jobs, which is there in many industries. But today I'm uh, hoping to learn about quant jobs in banking or the financial institutions. I'm happy to share what I know. It is a very wide field and there are a range of financial institutions dealing with quantitative analytics, modeling. So I'm happy to give you my perspective on it. The quantitative jobs itself is self-explanatory, but I want to always start with the very basic definition of the job. So my understanding is it is using mathematics, statistical models to solve a variety of problems. Coming from the expert, how do you define quant jobs? Yeah, more of experience and expertise because it's really a very wide field. But you're absolutely right. It is about using mathematical statistical methods. And the idea is to quantitatively estimate something where there is uncertainty, right? If it was just matching the balance sheet, asset uh, equals liability plus equity, that's more of an accounting job, right? In quantitative finance, it's primarily about trying to estimate something where you don't know, where you don't have a view of what could be the right value for it. It could be in pricing, it could be assessing risk, it could be assessing how much capital you need to hold, how much liquidity you need. So it's really about that, estimating something that has uncertainty and estimating and trying to quantify risk when needed. Mm -hmm. I want to read out something that I found online, which I thought was very interesting. It's a little older post the, on social media platforms where people are discussing different jobs. So I quote, every person that I know that calls themselves a quant does something slightly different and the job changes over time. In 2007, it, this is a slightly older post. It says in 2007, there was a lot about derivatives modeling. I don't know what that is. In 2014, it has a lot to do with risk analysis for regulators. And I have no idea what quants will be doing in 2020. Maybe it is Bitcoin. So maybe uh -huh. applications of different problems is where probably it's harder to know before people get into. Can you talk a little bit about oh, yeah. applications? You're absolutely right. Even that quote, although you say it's dated, it's still so relevant and it's still uh, so much defining and describing what the space is. So the financial industry itself mm -hmm. is comprised of various different players, right? You have the hedge funds and then you have the depository institutions, big and small, and everything in between, right? Initially, the whole idea, because quantitative modeling does require pe hiring people with sophisticated level of understanding and knowledge 
about these mathematical and statistical models. So that required a lot of investment. And really the places that could make that investment were revenue generating businesses, which relied on that expertise. So it was really more driven by hedge funds, pricing groups, trading desks, where you were really seeing the value, the cash register ring, when you can bring in that quantification of uncertainty, understand the risk and really trade on it, make money on it, right? Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of that. And there were a lot of different sophisticated instruments which were coming in. This is pre-Dodd Frank, which this was pre-2008 crisis, from which a whole bunch of regulations came in. And for big banks, separated out that function much more clearly and really reduced the amount of exposure which big banks could take. But before that, there was a lot in terms of creating CDOs, CLOs, different kinds of derivative products like the credit derivative products, which were credit derivative swaps, which were a big thing in the 2007 and prior period. So a lot of the, the quant people were focused on that. Since then, there has been a lot of shift just because of regulatory expectations, the whole idea of assessing risk and hence assessing how much capital do these institutions need to hold, especially large banking institutions and now even more so the smaller banking institutions. So that has become a big area. Like, how do you assess risk? Now it's no longer just about pricing, but really trying to figure out how to do risk. And really, in some ways, just if I want to give an analogy of how computers have permeated our everyday lives, the understanding of there are techniques and methods that are available. Some of them as simple as you have some linear estimation techniques embedded within Excel. Now Excel comes with... Hmm. Hey, you want to run a simple regression model? Here's a click of a button and you can do it. And that gives an analyst at the most junior level or even an analyst at a senior level, but not quantitatively literate, so to speak, the ability to use quantitative techniques. So that is in some ways, I would say, democratized the use of quantitative methods, but also given people the tools and the leverage to really make more sound, meaningful decisions and understand how we can really try and put a finger, put a number on that risk that we need to assess and guard against, right? Mm -hmm. So definitely there has been a range. And I have primarily been on the banking side. So just the way I see the quant world, I, and I like organizing things, so I kind of partition it into two buckets. One is the trading book quant. These are the people who have been you know, nuclear physicists and come to Wall Street. And there's been a lot of investment and they generate a lot of returns for their institutions. And this is where really the idea of quant came into being and what leverage and optimize. And they can be on the equity side, they can be on the fixed income side, derivatives. It's a vast open playing field and they really have a much more broader playing field because they typically belong to trading desks where there is more proprietary trading, hedge funds, those kinds of spaces. And then there are the banking book side of quants who are part of these larger institutions and post art Frank have gotten a lot more emphasis on. And even before there was these Basel regulations which are coming up, the whole idea of how can you assess risk. And some of these risks were very esoteric risks, like how do you think about reputational risk? Hmm. How do you think about strategic risk or operational risk? So they brought in a lot of statistical methods to think about these risk types. But that was all because Dot Frank required us to assess these risks much more clearly. And even right before Dot Frank, there was the Basel regulation, which was across various different countries where they wanted us to assess these risks. So I'm more on the banking book side of quant. I work for a, a large bank. So that's pretty much my background. Mm -hmm. But even, even within bank, the areas where quants come into the picture and are tabbed and leveraged has really widened. Mm -hmm. From just looking at the more traditional banking problems of risk. Hey, how much capital to hold? How much liquidity to hold? What is the interest rate risk? What is the credit risk? Because these are the more important and some of the more well understood and more traditional and more core banking type of risk that we undertake. 
But then there have been these new risk types, right? Operational risks, broad risk, like I said, reputation, strategic risks, right? It's strategic risk is so vague. What is the risk and how do you quantify the impact of the bank making incorrect strategic decisions? Hmm. You can think about it. It could be from some of your vendors that you select to the large management decisions that go in and uh, permeate through how they conduct their operations. Mm -hmm. So it is a very wide area. Mm -hmm. They're just realizing more that we're going to use more of these tools wherever we can. Is there a huge difference in the practice other than the application in different financial institutions like hedge funds versus banking versus investment banking? Does it differ in terms of the core practice? There is some degree uh, of difference because the bent is slightly different in certain areas. And we're talking about whole fields of econometrics, statistics, oh. math that get used and concepts that are used in physics or engineering, like the thermodynamics equation, mm -hmm. which is the underlying equation of how you do stochastic calculus and hence how you think about pricing certain sort of products. So there is a whole bunch of different tools and techniques that have gotten developed that have been used from other sciences and other fields mm -hmm. into this area modified. So depending on the kind of problem that you're solving, there will be, I would say, slight to major differences, right? Stochastic calculus tends to be used more on the trading side. And when you're thinking about some of the derivative products, the credit risk space, they use a lot more of regression type models or decision tree based models, more what you would look into the machine learning space. So those are econometric models, but here now there is econometrics and then there is machine learning right on top of it too. So there are models which could be yeah, as simple and plain as regression or logistics regression kind of models. There used to be this competing risk model. So there are various different techniques that could be used. Again, a lot of biostatistics also yeah. works on similar kinds of models. Then there is operational risk modeling, where we looked at, and this is an area that I was involved in, in a while ago, but that's where it's purely you're looking at these operational risks, large losses, as purely random phenomena, mm -hmm. almost the height of a wave coming here, right? What is the max height of a wave? So you're really borrowing from there. Literally focusing and zeroing in on these independent random variables and ones which are extreme. So how would you think about it? So there is a lot being uh, drawn from some of the more physical phenomena related areas. So it's really a broad range and it really helps to have cross-pollination because if you're thinking about a problem and there's a solution to it, which addresses certain aspects and you can see that particular technique being used in your area, that's great. That's fantastic, right? Like, for example, reputation risk. A lot of that scenario analysis-based approach was used for operational risk, and then we found some value in using it for reputational risk purposes, too. There is a lot of cross-pollination. There is also a lot of just how that particular institution wants to manage it risk mm -hmm. and what is the level of sophistication that they already have and how can they leverage that. Mm -hmm. it, is it typically that when you are entering in any type of corn job, one needs to also focus on the industry? Is that, I want to be in hedge funds or is it quite easy to switch around? I think it is fairly easy to switch around mm -hmm. if the kinds of problems and techniques that you have worked on are similar. You have the financial space, right? And in the financial space, you have hedge funds, you have banks. Mm -hmm. Now we have a greater separation and understanding of hedge funds. What they engage in is not what banks engage in. So they're looking at certain problems differently. But there are always techniques which can spell over. Mm -hmm. What banks do, for example, for credit cards or for fraud is something that I'm sure other institutions, which are non-banking institutions, could also learn and implement, right? When I was starting out in my career, I was thinking, hey, I have these statistical econometric skills. I could go into marketing space and market research, mm -hmm. or I could go into banking, right? Or there was biostatistics, right? So it was like 
all of these spaces are utilizing similar kinds of tools and techniques, so I could be much more at one of the cross. Yeah, that's where I think that the degrees like applied math and those things are still very popular, right? Because it gives, just broadens your playing field. That brings me to my next question, which was about your journey. At what point did you decide this is the line that I want to go into? Not necessarily banking. Tell me first about, okay, math as a line, right? If so to speak. Yeah. What was your thought process and journey like? And when did you start narrowing it down that this is what I can do with it? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And how far back should I go? <laughs> okay, I definitely did not dream to become like a quantitative <laughs> analytics person at all. That was not what my dream was growing up. It was more to be an architect. Huh. So I... Very interesting, yeah, in creativity. And it was not so much about math, but it was something about just spaces and thinking about how to organize and how to think about spaces, right? Structures always interested me. The metry always, a whole bunch of things that I was drawn towards. When I started out, pretty much throughout my formative years, it was like, hey, I'm going to do architecture. After 10th, I went into science and then it was like, okay, we're just going to go progress through it. What happened in my 11th grade was I decided to actually go speak with a friend's sister who was an architect who was actually just finishing her degree. And I don't think I caught her at the right time because she was just frustrated that the degree had taken so long. It was a very costly investment. And she didn't really have a great way of figuring out the payout for it. And that just immediately struck me. She, that person knew a company and they were going to work with them. And I had no clue. I had nobody in the business that I knew of. Mm -hmm. And I had heard that it was very difficult to start. So I was like, okay, architecture is out the door. I need to be financially stable. I was not interested in engineering so much, which was really the more common thing to do after your science degree. Um, so I was in, in a limbo in between. And at that point, I went and I met an, another person. I spoke. It's so important to meet and go speak with speak all people. of these people, especially as you're starting out. So I met my father's friend uh, and colleague, his daughter. And she was doing statistics and she was doing actuarial sciences. And she was just an amazing resource. And just to think about statistics and think about, again, the, the more fundamental way of thinking about not just numbers, but patterns. Mm -hmm. I found that very interesting. And now when I look back, I thought maybe it was the pattern thing, which kind of brought me closer to statistics from architecture. But she did, she was very upfront. It was a long, arduous process to go through all the different exams at the, there's an actuarial society of India to become a licensed actuary because that's what her path was. But what I found fascinating about statistics was because I just didn't know where I wanted to be, what I wanted to do, statistics seemed like it would give me the options. It would help me build the tools, but then I could go wherever and figure that out. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I found another friend who had decided to take up economics, mathematics, and statistics in her bachelor's in science program. And I had never taken economics up in high school or I didn't have any exposure to economics. So I didn't know how dry or mundane, as most people said, that subject was. But luckily, I stumbled upon, I entered into that program for my undergrad and I stumbled upon this teacher who was teaching there were just four students really mm -hmm. in that entire science program who had taken economics math and statistics and this teacher she was aspiring to do her uh, PhD abroad and she just had such a zest for economics and I kid you not that program was supposed to be offered only the first year it got offered the second year because all the four of us decided to stick with the program and we really wanted to have it offered for the third year too, but it, it was four of us against an entire institution. But that's where 
thinking about economics and then I graduated in statistics, thinking about economics and statistics together started making a lot more sense for me personally. And then statistics was great. I really enjoyed the program. And then in the final year, like I really understood the way it was opening up my mind, right? And just, it has a lot of depth and a lot of, just a lot of character, I would say. So that's something that, that really helped me. And then I decided to pursue master's in economics, but with my focus was econometrics and financial mathematics. And then I was like, I'm just going to be on the path to becoming an actuary. But then life had different plans and I decided to apply abroad and then I got into a PhD program over here and then worked through it. And there were lots of ups and downs and trying to figure out things, but it was really a good learning experience going through it. And the most important thing, which I think is essential for any career, but more specifically for a quantitative finance career is having that ability to learn things because a lot of things are not taught in school. Hmm. There are various programs that have come up. But there's a lot of rigor that is needed, a, a lot. And I know I think some of the software engineers and computer scientists in Silicon Valley too, I see that you have to constantly keep up to date on your skills and abilities and you have to over here too. So that's something that just being that self-learner, self-starter is going to be very important. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a, a very key thing that the PhD program taught me. When I finished the degree or was finishing the degree and trying to figure out what to do next, and again, through word of mouth, handing the resume to your senior, has everyone around I landed a job. And that's how the banking journey started. Mm -hmm. But I started in August 2008, 15 days before Lehman collapsed. <laughs> Well, it was a very interesting experience and I know it was not the best time for anybody else, but it was personally for me, really the best learning opportunity, mm -hmm. the best learning opportunity because first I was this new person. So I wasn't there doing a job that I needed to keep doing or working and working more at it, but I was this free agent who was told, go solve this problem. We don't know. These models are not working. So you figure out. We need to get an answer. Think creatively because all of these existing things were completely failing. Mm. So it was amazing to just go there, get your hands dirty. And for a quant quantitative finance person, really think about it from the first principles, right? Not relying on existing models, not relying on existing things that have been done, but really understand. Where is the risk over here? And how do I really assess that risk? So understanding the business, working with all the business partners, working with sometimes the front end teams, mostly we were in the middle office, but working with the senior managers, understanding how they're doing, how they're thinking about things, and then trying to figure out how to make this a repeatable process. Mm -hmm how to abstract the reality and make it repeatable so that it really becomes that model, right? A helpful model. Because in the end, we all know all models, as Tuki has said, I think uh, all models have an abstraction of reality. So uh, all models are, are going to fail, but it's how much use can you get out of them before you realize you hit that failure point. Yeah. Amazing. Interestingly, so, I think your decision's trajectory seems very on point because coincidentally, the last episode at the time of recording happens to be on architecture and we went into all these that you discovered so I'm many not. years ago. <laughs> That's very interesting. Well, one follow-up question. What is the actuary job? Uh, can you uh, talk a little? Oh, yes. It may sound a little morbid, but they're really calculating life expectancy, your mortality rates, basically, because actuaries are... You can think of it a little bit more broadly. Now, I forget what the exact definition is, but but basically it was in the life insurance companies oh, okay. that they were doing this. Yeah, they needed to assess what is your rate of mortality and then based on that, figure out what the premiums should be and then accordingly uh, make sure running a yeah, profitable enough venture. Mm -hmm. So it required assessing a lot of uh, basically this uncertainty, this 
risk of death. So it was really around that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. For you, would you say that you started honing in on okay, banking as a sector by the time you graduated or that was more, again, you discovered like you were, it could be any industry? <laughs> It was open. It was anyone who could give me a job. Like I said, I joined when we were really like the crisis had already started. Mm. So it was difficult to figure out what it, what that entire situation would look like. There were some other institutions across the U.S. who were like really hiring and saying, like, hey, yes, we need people because Everything that they were doing till now was failing. Hmm. So they needed more bodies, essentially, to put on the problem to figure out, like, how it was done with. So it was very interesting. Yeah, it seemed like a crazy time when people were also losing jobs. Hmm. That was also happening. But then also there was this a bit of a need for people who could come in and think differently. And I think this is, again, going back to quantitative finance and roles over there, and possibly this applies to across various different industries, but really understanding and understanding the business, right? Mm -hmm. Very central for you to be effective in your role, like whatever you're doing, right? Sometimes we are just like, oh, I'm, I like these kinds of models. I like these kinds of techniques and I'm just going to drill into that. You might be missing out on the bigger picture and you might be missing out on that interdisciplinary approach that you need to have for problem solving. Even if it is something that is more esoteric, more abstract and more technical, you do need to kind of branch out and think about all these different areas mm -hmm. where you can draw from. Mm -hmm. So that was something that I did in my PhD program. It was a much more interdisciplinary approach that I had to use to to the problem that I was looking at. So that, that is, I cannot, I cannot underscore enough the need for that. Mm -hmm. Do not just, you can't just be a credit risk modeler or a derivatives modeler and just sit with that. You do have to, things are always evolving in this space. So you do have to think about what are the products? How are they behaving? How? Has the customer behavior changed? How has the institutional behavior changed? And how can you better address what the risk is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's very interesting. So I wanted to understand how the quant roles are structured. I, I understand in every company to company, it might differ. But from the context of, let's say, for example, if it is a technology company, which is what I'm familiar with, there is a department that builds things and there is a department that sells things and there are departments in between that are facilitators, right, of this whole life cycle or the chain. Yeah. Where does quant fit in financial institutions? How is it structured yeah. usually? This is a little fragmented depending on what you're doing. Huh. So in the very traditional banking sector, what you would see with large institutions is you, there are people who are selling loans, there are underwriters underwriting the risk. And then you have all of these loans coming up. Your entire balance sheet is full of loans and then you have deposits, you have securities, you have a mix of different kinds of assets, a mix of different kinds of liabilities. So you want to understand the risk now, depending on the kind of risk that you want to understand. For example, credit risk. Then you're looking at, hey, here we have made, this is an asset, we have a loan out to somebody, what is the risk that the person will default on the loan or will not pay back its full amount? So that's credit risk. So then there'll be people who will be assessing credit risk. And it's important to assess credit risk because then they can price it in the loan hmm. correctly, right? Uh, so there are entire risk departments which are devoted to it. Typically, the risk departments will fall under the chief risk officer. That is a common role, a C-suite role that you will find in, in banking institutions. Uh, but then there are people who also want to price the risk and kind of figure out how we want to sell. There are things on the marketing side where we are producing new products, card products, 
mortgage products, various different kinds of now different kinds of loans and lines, different kinds of things that might come up. Even within cards, there are a bunch of different things. Even with deposits, there are a bunch of different kinds of products. So they uh, have pricing models and those are much more in the front line Hmm. where they're actually in the business lines developing these products and trying to sell them. But then there are quants for that too, for the pricing and the marketing side. Then there are quants who are thinking, oh, yep, there is credit risk, but there is interest rate risk too. And interest rate risk needs to be thought of differently. So there are different set of quants looking at that part. And then there are people who are looking at all these risks combined and some other types of risks too. Like I talked about operational risk. There, there is definitely risk that we think about in terms of fraud. Uh, so very high level, these are some of the broad categories of risk. I'm sure I'm forgetting the other couple of them, but broadly, these are the kinds of risks that mm-hmm. we would look at. And when you would try, there's, yeah, capital, right? So there are models for capital. Once you've assessed the risk and you quantified it, right? How do you then allocate that out to the businesses? So there are models for that. And then liquidity is the other side of it. Like, how do you make sure that you have enough liquid assets? That's another risk type that people look at. Mm -hmm. And they will be usually embedded in those respective teams. Is that how it works usually? Not necessarily. So again, within the quantitative roles, you can think of it one as a development where you are actually building out the models. Some of these development type roles would be in the front line. Like pricing teams would be very integrated with the business itself. They'll be in the front line. The risk teams will typically be in the second line area. We typically, when we think about risk in banking, we think about the front line, which takes on risk. The second line, which quantifies and oversees that risk. And then there's third line, which is really like the auditors, internal auditors who are making sure that there are adequate government processes and the hmm. front line is abiding by their policies. And the second line has good oversight of what the front line is. So in the second line is typically where the CRO function resides, the chief risk officer function, and that's where they do quantification of these risks. Now, because we use so many models, we also have validation of the model. Hmm. You need to make sure that there is somebody who understands the model risk, right? Hmm. You understand the business risk and you try to quantify it. But you know that models are limited in their capability. All models are wrong, but some are useless, right? So how do you assess how wrong can the model be and what can the impact of that be? So that is a function of model risk. And those are the people who are not actively building models to be used in business, but are validating those models. Those teams... Typically, because they're looking at modern risk, tend to be more together hmm. in, in a function. So there is a model validation function, which tends to be like one function which deals with all the models across the bank. The development teams can be more dispersed, but the validation teams tend to be more consolidated. Now, this is a model that, again, this kind of organization can change mm-hmm. from business to business and depending on the risk type too. Mm-hmm. But typically that is what we have. And then in the third line too, we have teams who are dedicated at doing the oversight, third line oversight of models and they're specifically looking at models. This gives a good uh, understanding of how it is embedded. Another related question that I wanted to ask is, how is the work structured? Like day in the life of a Kukon person, I totally understand the role can change, but Typically, is this something that is like a continuous form of work where they are u- utilizing these models on a regular basis, on a periodic checks type of thing? Or it is project-based where there is a certain type of problem that needs to be assessed or a t- certain product. Tell me a little bit about the nature of work itself, like how it is structured, project-based versus ongoing. It's both. Mm-hmm. So... Your projects are in the form of you want to build a model. Some new product is on the anvil or there is a new model that's built and the validation is coming, looking at it. Those are the more project types, right? Oh, we need to build this, start. Here's the start time and here is a finish date to it. And you work towards that. But once the model is built and it is run on a repeatable basis, then comes the problem of 
is the model functioning the way it should be <laughs> and running and analyzing the results of the model, making sure that it needs to have tweaks and stuff like that. And just being in this area, in this modeling area where you're you're abstracting you're not projecting the complete reality you're really abstracting you want to go in and really in a very pithy way try to figure out what you need to estimate right but there are so many factors that change and that just as you want to be sensitive to the business hmm. so you can't be building a model that does not mend itself to the needs of the business to the of the business environment so there is constant updates and stuff that are happening. There are things that will constantly fail, right? And then you need to go in and amend and understand why, what is failing and how do you address it? But there is a lot of work that is ongoing monitoring that happens both by the developers, but also by the validator and overseer. And then as our understanding of models and the business evolves over time, there are all these new developments coming in. Or there are going to be things where we are just heightening the standards or wanting to go for greater accuracy and precision mm-hmm. for things that we know we understand well and we can do it. So that's, that's always there. Mm-hmm. So it's both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Coming to the point that you made earlier that it's like school doesn't prepare for everything and there are a lot of skills that one needs to develop. So let's talk about what are the skills and maybe even some personality traits one needs to be successful in this line. Yeah, that's a really good one because I don't know if there is something which is markedly different. May one of the things is that as I said, you need to be a self-starter and learner because things will evolve and change. With this piece of work, it's not something which you get and then you hit back, right? It's not a game of volley. You really have to sit with it and understand what you're trying to do. And that depth needs to really come through both on the technical side as well as on the business side. So it's very important to Stay connected to the various developments that are happening in the industry, thinking and speaking to various different people. Like I said, the multidisciplinary approach is really very important, but also to think very critically and very analytically, right? And that really requires a lot more thinking time, especially if you're on the model validation side. Oftentimes, you're not just responding to, hey, the business wants to change this to that, and we're fine with it. You have to think through all the different combinations of why did we in the first place have it this way? And then what is it that's changing and what else could or should be changing along with? And when is it okay to still have this structure, even if there are other changes happening? And when is it that we need to really deconstruct it again when there are too many changes happening? So you have to think through all of those aspects. So really being able to sit down and think critically and be able to put in that self-learning as much as you can is going to be, again, is going to be critical. Mm-hmm. I know it's true of most of the other places too. Yeah, okay. it, it's true over here too. Mm-hmm. And coming to the core educational path, you have statistics and economics background. What are some of the other college majors or education paths oh. that has entry to this role? Yeah. Engineering, math, people who have done biostatistics too, which is again a field of statistics, but statistics, these are typically, and engineering itself covers a broad range of fields, right? So these are typically the fields that you will see people coming from. In terms of risk and thinking about risk, there are people who have done things more in the humanities and liberal arts areas and who have come in, yeah, but like, I said, they were there to come in, put in the work and kind of work through it. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of learning that you can do on the job. It's going to be taxing if that's where your heart lies and you will put in that effort. So people have done that too. But typically, I will tell you, it's much more easier if you are in the sciences, in the hard sciences, right? Like physics primarily physics and different forms of physics. I know that people who have come from chemistry too, 
I haven't seen too many from biology, but I know there are people who do like biomedical engineering or biostatistics. Mm -hmm. And then the the finance, statistics, mathematics fields, the okay. other ones that we see. Mm -hmm. A lot of people from economics of course too. Mm -hmm. People who come from life sciences, um, are they also involved in modeling? Do they have to pick up on the math skills? The I think like that. Wow. If they have done, I'm not sure if I've seen anybody. I know people who have done life sciences, but then move towards biostatistics. Mm -hmm. So like epidemiological models, right? They are very good contagion models over there. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of, if you have done some sort of mathematical modeling, I'm sure you can come, you come in with some skill set and then you can work towards developing it. Uh -huh. And there are a lot of courses that you can take up on Coursera and stuff. But also there are certification programs that are out there, which bring in that rigor for, to become a financial engineer. And some of these are accredited, offered by the universities, masters of financial mathematics. The University of Minnesota has a really good program over there. And then they have... There are other quant finance programs and licenses that you can get to. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And about the career path, what is the entry point typically in the quant departments and what does the career ladder look like? Yeah, well, most uh, typical entry point is you're starting your career over here. Like you're fresh out of school and you have just started because you come armed with your knowledge of statistics, mathematics, and applying it in economics, bio, wherever you're engineering, wherever you're coming with. But you're coming with some sort of hard sciences background and understanding, and then you're applying it over here. So typically, the entry point is, is a starter, junior, fresh out of school at the junior level, at the junior most position. We do have, I, I know... My institution does, but there are lots of other institutions too, which have internship programs. Mm -hmm. So that's a good way to get into it. There are people who sometimes, they're traders who spend their time on the desk trading, and now they want to get into the middle office business of really developing models. And because they've spent so much of time trading, they have some strategies in mind and they think they can work on things. And they really have that depth of knowledge and understanding and the grit to go through it. So then you'll see some of them come in too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but typically a quant starts out as a quant at the junior most entry atlist. level. And then they grab like an atlist, yes. Mm -hmm. You will come in, you will learn within your group. You will get to work on different projects, which is basically different models. You try to understand the business, the different kinds of products that you are looking at. And people can spend their entire careers in some of these uh, places. So typically, that's how you start. Then you get to the lead level. You get to the manager level. At the lowest rung of the managerial level, that's where you are expected to really have a very good understanding of the business, right? And get through. I, at the deep level two, you start building all of that. But at the manager level, I think is when you start thinking about what do you want to do? I've seen this with folks around and with myself too, trying to figure out, do you want to be a quant manager only? Do you want to be a business manager, mm -hmm. a risk manager? What do you want to get to? So that's where you have to start making decisions for yourself based on your own experience, your own expertise and your bent of mind. Mm -hmm. But that's where you try and figure out whether you want to still be on the technical path. There are lots of quants who, especially on the trading side, like I said, you can have a pretty good position, uh, a well-paying job, being a quantitative mm -hmm. analyst who's still bringing in that kind of revenue. Mm -hmm. So you can do that. Or you can take a more managerial path, people path, and then work through the risk organization or the finance organization. or there are other, like there are data sciences and then there is information security roles now at the C-suite level also for some institutions. Mm -hmm. So there are different paths that you take. Mm -hmm. Does the level of education make any difference in the progression? Like, for example, one having only undergrad degree versus grad versus a do you know, doctoral uh, degree, does it make a difference? 
I think it gives you a little bit of edge depending on what your work has been. Mm -hmm. If your doctoral degree was not very directly related to the techniques that you're going to be using in your work, then coming in at the master's level, with then your doctoral degree is basically you having that same level of knowledge as a master's level candidate with the same sort of coursework and credits that you have taken. You probably have a, a bit of an edge because you might PhD teaches you perseverance and learning the art of learning, right? So you might have a little bit of an edge, but that's really a personal thing. Mm. Some of the areas are fairly sophisticated. So typically a PhD program will set you up better just because you have told yourself that you can work through it because mm. see, you went through the PhD program, right? Mm. So it, it's really over there. I know there have been several people who at the master's level have taken PhD level courses and have done absolutely fantastic too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But advanced degree is going to be very important. It will give you an edge for sure. Cool, cool. That's really great. Finally, my question to you is, what are some of the resources for uh, students who are interested in the quantitative world? What are some of the resources that you have found very useful and you would like to recommend? Uh, typically, if you are like thinking about risk, FRM, financial risk management, is a good licensee program. You can get that license. It's good. PFA is another good one. Gives you business understanding. So this is all about understanding risk and business from the financial industry perspective. But your hardcore understanding of math, statistics, that needs to come through your technical training, which either you get as your undergrad and your master's level, PhD level program, or you go in, pursue those particular certifications. There are various one-year programs, financial engineering programs, which are very much geared towards this. So they can definitely look that up. You can even go on Coursera and browse or whatever your choice of getting these kinds of online education programs are. There's a lot over there that you can explore too. And then CFA, FRN typically will give you that extra edge because people will know you're already vested into the financial industry and you come with that understanding. Those are not requirements per se, but it signals well. It looks good to have come armed with all of that. The own work already done, right? Thank you, Swati. Really informative session to give a peek into the world of quant. Thank you so much for coming on my podcast and sharing your expertise and experience in this field. Thank you. And what a really thoughtful set of questions, Pratibha, you had for somebody really starting out, like, just going and knowing more about an industry and really breaking it down. What does it look like? What does it really feel like? What was your journey? Where can we find resources? Really important questions. So thank you, really. And I'm looking forward to the one on architecture. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Thank you. This is Career Calling, and I'm your host, Pratibha Pandit. For more contents like this, please don't forget to subscribe, leave a rating, or a comment. Thank you for tuning in.